Good morning. I'm so grateful to be here. Let me get this set up real quick. We just drove nine hours yesterday from uh, San Francisco. That's my new home. I say my home is the world. <laughs> um, so good morning. I'm so glad to be here. This is um, probably one of the first, actually it is one of the first cities on this new tour that I'm embarking on. This is the first tour of my ministerial uh, pursuits. And so San Diego happens to be, this community happens to be one of my first. And so I'm, yeah, we can clap for that. <laughs> so I'm grateful to be here. Let's take a collective breath together. I always like to see who's in my audience because I got here 10 minutes before and now I get to see who's here. <laughs> So uh, my topic today is the sacred amidst the shadow. And um, this past September, as Reverend Patty was talking about, um, I was in Ukraine uh, at the very last minute. I took a flight there five days before this annual peace conference because one of our ministers, Reverend Barbara Leger, said, hey, Savannah, um, I can't be at the conference this year. Could you fill in? And I was like, Barbara, you know that that's like in five days, right? And I was nesting, and I had just moved to my new home in Berkeley. And um, I've always had this gypsy spirit, this adventurous uh, nature of wanting to be out in the world. But, you know, I'm nesting, and I'm wanting to be home. And, and she says, you know, I can't do it. And I said, okay, we'll see what happens. And I'm not unfamiliar with revolution and being in the midst of chaos and craziness. Um, but there was something within me that said, okay, just do it. And so there I am at SFO at the airport, and uh, the couple before me had just checked in, and they were heading to Hawaii, and the gate checker was like, oh, have an incredible trip. And he looks at my itinerary as I step up to the platform, <coughs> and he says, are you sure you want to go there? <laughs> <laughs> to Kyiv. And I said, yes, I got myself here, and this is happening. I'm doing this. And so... I embarked on this long journey um, with a layover in Switzerland, and um, what happened after that was pretty incredible, and I'm gonna share that a little later in my talk, because I think it really speaks to what happens when we put ourselves in, in, in the midst of challenge or conflict, or what happens when we learn to embrace the dark stuff. So. The question is, how do we embrace the shadow and the difficulty and the challenges in our lives when it shows up on our doorstep? I believe that the definition of the shadow, well, the definition in the dictionary says that a shadow is a dark area or shape produced by a body coming between rays of light and a surface. Have any of you seen, uh, there's a picture on uh, social media circulating right now, it's National Geographic. And it's this photograph taken in Saudi Arabia of all these camels that have gone across the desert. Some of you are shaking your head. And what it is is you see these huge uh, black you know, shadows, and it looks like the actual camel itself. But if you look really closely, you will see the little tiny camel and the white light that it, that it is, the actual shape of the camel. And it's just emitting its shadow. I believe that the shadow is the hidden and the disowned aspects of ourselves. It's the parts of ourselves that we don't want people to know about. It's the parts of ourselves that maybe we don't like, or maybe it's just like, uh, I don't want to look at that. And what happens is, is that when we go about our lives not looking at that stuff, then sometimes it comes out sideways. And it can show up as anger or depression. It can show up as blame or projection. And so, Embracing the shadow uh, really is about being willi willing to look at it. And most of us, for most of us, that's really scary. Being willing to look at ourselves, you know, we can look at the world right now with effect and the current events going on. And it's so easy, right, to get sucked in. It's so easy to get sucked into what's happening in the world outside of ourselves. And what I've seen in my own life is that it's also very easy to look for external validation in the world to people and situations and events to make us whole, to make us okay, to make us feel complete. But what it's really about is looking within ourselves and seeing that 
It starts from the inside. We say that in this teaching a lot, but this is an inside job. Michael Beckwith of the Agape Center, uh, the International Center in Los Angeles says, the power within you is greater than the power in the world. The power within you is greater than the power in the world. And yet it's so easy for us to look to materialism and consumerism and everything outside of ourselves to make us okay. Sometimes we get involved in these toxic relationships, right? And we keep going back and then we leave and then we go back. Or maybe it's the diagnosis that you receive, the health diagnosis, and it's hard to turn from the condition. It's hard to, to remember the truth in the midst of those moments. That's why we have practitioners. So here I am in Switzerland, and I'm getting on the plane. And what I realized very quickly is that there's nobody on the plane. <laughs> like, <laughs> right? Right? So all of a sudden, I went into panic because it was half empty. And I thought, am I really doing this? And you know, once you're on the plane, you can't turn back. Like <laughs> there's, there's no way going back. And so here I am sitting there thinking, OK, you have been brought to this moment by divine appointment. Do you really believe you're here on purpose? Can you really, really count on everything that you've been trained to know and to embody and to believe up until this moment? And so I started to pray. And my go-to prayer, if I, if, if I can't remember or if I'm, I'm confused or whatever, is there's only one life. That life is God's life. That life is perfect. And that life is my life now. We say that there's only one life. That life is God's life. That life is perfect. That life is my life now. And so I continued to say this mantra the whole trip. It was a pretty long flight. And you know what was so incredible? Is once I got there, I was greeted by a very familiar face. You know, traveling back and forth to Ukraine over the last 11 years, I've been there six times. And I have a, a taxi driver that I know well, and he doesn't speak any English, but we managed to get by. My friend Slavic, he takes me to our, our center where we're going to have this conference. And we normally would have this conference in Crimea, which many of you uh, may know is now occupied by Russia. And so this time we had to have it in a, a wooded area outside of the city where the, our center is. And on one of the evenings there, I facilitated this process. And this process is something that our teens do at our youth camps here in religious science. And we call it AB Love. It's like a nurturing process. And so basically what it is is you have a group of two people, two, two groups. And one group stands in the center with their eyes closed, arms out, ready to receive uh, unconditional love. And then the other group comes to them and, and gives hugs and sweet, sweet words of affirmation. And it took me 10 years to bring this process to Ukraine because at the time I remember people were like, we don't want to touch each other. Like, uh, we, we're not used to this. And so we finally got to a place now in consciousness where people are open and receptive. And so here we are, the sun has gone down and we have candles lit all over the ground. And I'm facilitating this process, and all of a sudden, I see this group of people coming from the distance. And they're walking up as if they're curious and intrigued by what's going on. And I'm thinking, oh, man, because this is public. And all of a sudden, the little ones, there were probably two or three little ones, maybe under the age of six, came into the circle. And they put their hands out, and their eyes were closed. And it's like they knew. It's like they hadn't forgotten. And so they just received the love and they stood there. And the rest of the people were kind of you know, looking around and they joined our group. And what I realized later is that these were families that were displaced from Eastern Ukraine because of the war going on there. And so they were staying in this place. And so I watched how the vibration and the consciousness of what was created there affected those people and everyone else. They were welcomed into our circle and I got to hear many of their stories afterwards of what was going on in their lives. And so I say this because our vibration absolutely matters. That the intention and the love and the energy and the vibration that you walk around with every day on a daily basis in your workplace, with your families, in your relationships, absolutely makes a difference on the greater uh, collective consciousness of the world. And that was absolutely 
seen and felt by what I discovered there. And so what I realized is that what looked like a very scary experience actually was quite beautiful. And I realized that I was absolutely there on divine appointment. You, you wouldn't have even known that a war was going on. I have a beautiful friend here from Ukraine. He's sitting in the back. His name is Vitalik, and I've known him 11 years. And uh, we were sitting on the, on the river, near the river, during that time. And he looked at me, and he said, you wouldn't even know a war is going on right now, would you? It's so interesting, our perception and where we put our attention. So the second thing about embracing the shadow is learning to see that the dark stuff is actually a gift. I recently had a client come to me and say, you know, Savannah, um, how do you know when you're over something? Like, how do you know when you've walked through it? How do you know that it's forgiven? Or how do you know? And I said, you know, for me, it's when I can actually look at the experience and see that I gained something from it, that there was a gift that I was given from it, that there's no energy about it anymore. So when I talk about it, I'm not all angry or I'm not um, upset about it. And so darkness is a gift. And I think dark darkness is a gift because it allows us to see the unhealed aspects of ourselves that maybe we haven't looked at. You know, people are great mirrors to us, right? All of our relationships, if you notice, um, sometimes the relationship I was in uh, then, like five years before, I'm still repeating the same pattern with the next partner. Have you ever had that experience? And you're like, why is this happening? I thought I got over this, right? But we're triggered, and, and a lot of it is because it could be old wounding or past events that are affecting the present moment now because we haven't looked at them. And those things are things like blame, anger, rage, sadness, grief, repressed things. And so we owe it to ourselves as whole individuals because we know that we're part of this greater wholeness. We know that we can't have the light without the dark. We need both of it, but none of it is bad. And so when we can start looking at these things as a gift, like how did this experience and situation grow me? As Reverend Patty said, how is it using me? Like, what was the quality within me that I had to cultivate in order to move through this experience? You know, what's really cool about being on a, on a magazine cover is that I can quote myself now. <laughs> <laughs> I always wanted to do that. So this is from uh, the article. How many of you got to read it by chance or had the article? Okay. Yeah, that was a really incredible thing. We must trust the creativity of the darkness the holy unknown places, for they bear rich fruit when we've released our attachment to the way things must be. So I really believe that there is a transformational something that happens when we're willing to sit with the discomfort, when we're willing to sit with the dark stuff. There's, it's like creative soil. It, it's like we're broken down to a place where the heart wants to open wide open. Like it, it just wants to break open. When I was in Egypt during 2012, um, it was a very scary time. I could hardly breathe most days. And I was walking around as this little light being, but I felt like my light had been dimmed because it was so heavy. And so it took all the courage I had in me just to leave my apartment every day. And I remember my beloved at the time, who I was with, um, was Egyptian. And he kept wondering what was wrong with me because I was having a hard time, and I thought, how, how can I see light? How do I see the divine in the midst of all of this corruption and destruction and war and military and fires burning in the streets and just all of this? How am I, wh what is my mission here? Why am I here? What, what was I brought here for? And what I realized is that it stripped me of all my roles. If any of you have traveled the world, you realize that there's something that happens when, when you are in between like uh, time zones and cultures and you're immersed in something that's totally foreign to you. I call it this cultural dissonance that happens. It's like I feel like I'm an alien in my own country and in this country and I don't know how to make sense of all of it. Have any of you had this experience? Yeah. I, I, yeah. And so <coughs> what I realized was happening is that all of the ego identifications of how I had had labeled myself in this country and into the world had been completely stripped down to the, bare, to the bare essence of me. And so I was forced to look at myself. I was forced to see myself in ways that I don't think I would have seen 
had I stayed here. And so what I got to see was anger and rage and stuff that we talk about in our prac training. And I thought, I spent two years working on myself. Where did this come from? <laughs> like, this, this was not part of me. And so my beloved at the time was like, you are crazy. Like, I don't know what is going on with you. And I really did feel crazy. But what was amazing about that it was that it allowed me to, to start writing. So it became a cathartic experience. So I used that experience to create a new story, to cultivate something else. So people say, well, what did that experience do for you? And I said, well, I had to cultivate a certain level of, of assertiveness in order to survive, in order to get through my day without being followed or harassed every single day I left the apartment. And so I use that to, to just say that sometimes these experiences and the challenges you may be going through, they, they have something there for you. There is something in it for you if you can sit with it long enough in the discomfort. And the great thing, too, is that that article would have never come about had I not done that, had I not taken the leap of faith and moved my life to Egypt, had I not moved through a really difficult, dark experience. I set an intention when I was 15 years old that I wanted to write for Science in my magazine. And 16 years later, here we are. The other thing about embracing the shadow is that where is your attention? Where is your attention most of your days? People uh, say that the, the five people that you surround yourself with the most, you start to become like those people, right? It's the same thing with our attention, and we teach this in our philosophy. It's like, where is your attention? Is your attention on scarcity or lack or limiting thoughts? Where is my mind? What is my mental practice? Where am I putting my intention in every moment? Can I be present in this moment? Or is my intention on, on fear and worry and scarcity and, and the situation and the drama of everything going on? That's when we get to really practice coming back to center and remembering the truth with a capital T. Because many of us get stuck in the facts, right? We get stuck in, well, this is what's happening and this is the situation and it's all the facts. But when we come back to the truth, we realize the truth of our essence. We remember who we are and whose we are. This divine expression of love on this planet. And e every single one of us was here and is here to express that gift uniquely in our own way. And so for me, it was about surrendering to love. In those moments of rage, I had to surrender to something greater than me. You know those moments when I'm, I'm sure you've had a dark night of the soul and you're on the floor praying to God, anything, to make it go away. It's about surrendering, surrendering to something greater that wants to happen in your life. From the magazine, it says, for all of us, we are always getting the opportunity to surrender moment by moment to the presence, to love itself, to something greater than we can even rationalize or think of. Another way we embrace the shadow is by building our faith muscles. So something that has been going on for the last few years of being this traveling gypsy is that I've had this opportunity to really deepen my connection and my relationship with the divine and the God of my understanding. And as ministers, I think it's a never-ending journey. As people, it's a never-ending journey of what is my spiritual practice? What is it that brings me back to center when I am off kilter, when I am stuck in fear, when I'm stuck in anger? What is it that pulls me back? And I would say it's your spiritual practice. It's your connection to life itself. It's cultivating that relationship and knowing, as I said before, there's only one. And that one is my life, and it's your life, and I'm expressing as that. And can I remember in all moments, even in the dark stuff, that there is a light here, that there is a purpose here, that that essence is me, and that essence is you. So what is your solid foundation? What do you build it upon? Is it a deeper faith in life? Is it a deeper trust in life? What is that quality that wants to be embodied by you today? Ernest Holmes, who I love, he says, um, thoughts which are built upon a realization of the divine presence has the power to neutralize negative thought, to erase it, just as light has the power to overcome darkness, not by combating darkness, 
but by being exactly what it is, light. And in the Bible it says, and the light shineth in the darkness, and the darkness comprehended it not. So we need both. You know, sometimes uh, in our philosophy we talk about turning from the condition, right? We talk about not looking, not turning from the condition and affirming the truth. And what I believe, I take it a step further in saying that we don't, we don't deny that the condition exists. We don't say, oh no, I don't have that experience or I'm not feeling angry or I don't have that health diagnosis. But what we do is we turn our attention to the truth and, and, and away from giving it energy. That's the way that I, I look at that, is that I don't, I'm not in denial. I'm not in what we call spiritual bypass and saying, oh, no, it's all good because it's all God, right? Sometimes we have a tendency, I think, to do that um, when we're first beginning. We think, oh, well, everything's perfect, whole, and complete. And I'm that, too, which is true. And I don't have to look at that. But what I'm offering for us today is that we do look at it, that we look at it right in the face, that we sit with it, that we sit with discomfort, and we look at what is this here to show me? What is the gift in this situation? And what is the truth about this situation? With a capital T. So my call to action for you today is to really be honest with yourself. To re-remember who and whose you are. Whose you are, this loving embodiment of love and joy and peace and harmony on the planet itself. That your presence matters. That you have something so divinely unique about you that wants to express itself in the world in a powerful way. That you remember that. That you remember that your vibration matters and that regardless of the condition or whatever is going on, that there is a gift there in it for you if you're willing to look at it long enough. You know, what Egypt taught me was that I was stronger than I thought. Sometimes we're pushed to the very edge because something great wants to happen. There's a saying, I think Michael Bef Beckwith says, uh, some of you might remember it, the pain pushes until the vision pulls. You've heard this. The pain pushes till the vision pulls because there is a bigger vision than sometimes we even know for our lives. And sometimes it takes just one step out of our comfort zone. Most great teachers, at least that I know of, didn't get all the way here just by grace itself, right? There was some breakdown. There was some breakdown and then there was some breakthrough and then something magical happened. And so look back on your life and see, how did you get to this moment? Do you see that every single thing that happened to you up until this point had to happen for you to be where you are now? Even when you're in the midst of something so crazy and so difficult, I look back at those moments and I go, oh my gosh, I'm so much stronger than I ever knew. And I had to cultivate that because it was what was required of me to be able to stand here today. And we all have that. All of us do. And so how will you reframe your story that you're telling right now? If you're in a difficult, challenging situation right now or time in your life, what is the new story you want to create? Where do you really want to put your attention? Where can you put your attention? And what are you willing to do? Are you willing to have the courage to look at it and to sit with it and to pray and know the truth or have someone hold it for you? That is my call to action for you today. So we see the gift. We see the good. And in closing, my, my quote here is from the magazine. When we are able to meet people where they are, standing in truth, love, harmony, freedom, tolerance, acceptance, and compassion, we will move the world with our conviction of love and radiance. And when we have truly seen the underbelly of a culture, its darkness and its light, the places where it must grow, shift, and change, just as these places must within ourselves. I truly believe we have become global citizens. So let us go into prayer now. Closing the eyes, taking a deep breath. Remembering the power and the presence and the allness of the goodness of love itself is right where we are. That there is a grace and an ease that carries us through our day that there is only one, and we are connected to that one. 
for I know there is never, ever, ever any separation between me and this good. For I know that everything is working for good for me and for every single person in this room. That all of our needs are met in every moment. That we are truly blessed. That we are able to release the doubt, the fear, the worry, the scarcity, the lack, the limitation. Fully recognizing and knowing that God is a powerful force in my life and in your life. That there is something so powerful that wants to speak through me and you in this moment to express more of yourself and your life in profound and magnificent ways. I know that we are nurtured and guided and supported in all of our endeavors, in all of our finances, in all of our relationships. In every way imaginable, we have the support that we need and the love and the continued faith that everything is well, that everything is working for good right here and now. And so I know this for my life and for your life, and I give thanks for these words. I give thanks for this prayer, releasing it into the activation of love itself, knowing that all is well. And so it is. Amen.